I want to welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining us today for Roots in Housing. I'm Todd David, Executive Director of the Housing Action Coalition. On behalf, on, on behalf of HACC, we're honored to be joined today by an inspiring group of activists, advocates, and leaders to discuss the Bay Area's housing and climate crisis, how the two issues are connected, and what we can do as a community to address them. For those of you who are new to our work, the Housing Action Coalition is a member-supported nonprofit that advocates for building more homes at all levels of affordability to help alleviate the Bay Area and California's housing shortage, displacement, and affordability crisis. As a small team, we regularly collaborate with partner organizations throughout the Bay Area to accomplish our advocacy goals. And to that end, we'd like to extend a special thank you to the Housing Leadership Council, YIMBY Action, and Greenbelt Alliance for co-sponsoring this event, and to Zoe Siegel's Greenbelt, and to Zoe Siegel, Greenbelt's Director of Climate Resilience, for moderating today's panel. Uh, before I hand the reins over to Zoe, however, I am thrilled to welcome California State Senator Josh Becker to our virtual stage to discuss how his legislative work addressing housing and climate at the state level. We have some uh, pre-planned questions, but please feel free to submit questions for the Senator in the chat. And if time permits, we will do a brief Q and A. So Josh, please uh, please join me. Good to see you. And- uh, Good to see you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. So looks like you're looks like you're on the go there. So we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. So let me start with a couple of the questions, uh, Josh. So why was environmentalism a top priority for you when you got elected to the Senate? Well, thank you. First of all, it's great to be here. And uh, thanks everyone joining on a Friday afternoon. I hope some of you have drinks and cocktails for happy hour to certainly make the discussion more interesting, at least my part of it. Um, but yeah, listen, it's always, you know, it's one of these things I think it's a bit innate, you know, whether you kind of deeply care about this issue. And certainly it's been the case for me. I've worked, uh, my first job out of college was with an environmental consulting firm in DC. We planned the first clean air marketplace conference for EPA back in 1992. Um, so it's always intersected uh, my work. And as we'll talk about today, certainly with the intersection of housing and, uh, and climate, it gets to uh, so many other uh, critical issues for our society as well. So uh, just always been a priority for me and one of the reasons I ran uh, for the state Senate. And I'm really privileged to be able to use the platform to uh, work on these issues broadly defined, including chairing a new subcommittee we're launching very shortly uh, on our clean energy future and being vice chair of our, uh, of our, um, of our joint uh, climate change working group with the, um, uh, with the House and the Senate. Great. Um, so... Uh, can you tell us about your legislative work at the intersection of housing and the environment? Uh, you know, what are you currently focused on? Uh, sure. Well, I point to probably sort of three things. I mean, fundamentally, um, as you know, uh, most of our greenhouse gas, in other words, uh, you know, the majority, almost 50 percent is from uh, transportation, uh, are from cars. And um, so whatever we can do to cut down on that and to cut down to make housing more affordable and have people drive less is also gonna help us achieve our client goals, um, our climate goals. Another uh, perspective, sorry, so I'll be a little loud here from a, a I think a non-electric motorcycle that's revving up here. Um, the, the, just, uh, so you know, um, we can, just so you know, we can hear you fine. It's not too loud. Okay, great, great, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, but another piece is building materials. As we ramp up, as we build more housing, uh, as we build uh, more public transportation, as we build other things, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we are building things with a low carbon uh, building, low carbon building materials. So as some of you know, cement and concrete, you know, cement being really the flour in the cake of concrete, uh, but cement and concrete account for 8% of our global carbon emissions. Uh, and cement is partly that's because 40% because it's energy intensive to make and 60% is just process emissions when you make cement. And so last year I had the first bill of the country that targeted cement and we had first net zero target for any sector of the California economy to get a net zero target uh, for 
uh, cement. And this year I have a bill to make sure that the state is procuring low carbon concrete. And so that's the bill that we're back with this year, concrete being more complicated than say steel or other things because there's different concrete formulations for different uh, uses. But I think I'm optimistic that that bill uh, will also pass and make sure that we use low carbon and ultimately carbon negative uh, building materials. Um, lastly, um, we have to make sure that it's cheaper to build affordable housing in a, in a whole bunch of ways. And you know, housing policy broadly defined that you all uh, work on and we're very grateful for. I do have a bill, a kind of a wonky bill this year that the affordable housing developers are very excited about, uh, which is um, right now we require affordable housing developers to maintain a reserve for each product that can, each project that can cost as much as $3 million for each uh, project to be set aside that's never needed. And so how creating a pool reserve uh, will help uh, dramatically lower the cost for um, affordable housing uh, projects that are uh, developed. So those are three very specific things uh, that we have this year, as well as looking at ways, uh, working with Scott Wiener and the housing uh, committee, have a bill that's looking at things like, how can we encourage things like um, home sharing? How can we encourage things like, um, uh, like uh, some of the interim, um, sorry, permanent supportive housing that's been built as well. Uh, other creative ways to um, get lots of affordable housing in our community, uh, in addition to the efforts to uh, build market rate and other uh, housing in our community. So those are probably three areas without going on too long. <laughs> no, great. I appreciate it. Thank you. So can you can you tell us a bit about the California blueprint and how that affects housing production? Yeah, well, um, we'll have some more updates after today. And I don't know if you were watching the, um, the, the governor's May revise, obviously critical milestone in our budget process here, as you well know, Todd. Um, we are projecting a 97 billion dollar surplus, which seems impossible. So uh, grateful to all of our entrepreneurs who contributed to that and taxpayers. Um, he's proposed about two and a half billion for housing uh, programs. So that's been an important part of it, about uh, 500 million to convert vacant malls and storefronts into housing and a billion in support for infill developments. Um, and I just signed, I know we have a number of pieces of legislation around SB 375 that I'm sure will be of interest to all of you that Laura Freeman's leading. I just signed a budget letter. Uh, that uh, another assemblywoman is leading uh, around 375. So uh, support of infill development um, and other projects that can reduce vehicle miles uh, traveled. Uh, in addition to that, the, the blueprint creates more money for Project Home Key, for homelessness programs, and really important, about a billion dollars for the multifamily housing program and the housing accelerator program. Because as you know, we had a huge backlog of projects waiting state funding and, um, and not getting it. We put a big dent in that last year, about 1.75 billion and about a billion uh, dollars here. So I think, you know, the, the governor is trying to be um, systematic, trying to be comprehensive around housing development. I'll look forward to hearing from all of you. I think you think we are accomplishing that, um, but those are some of the, uh, uh, the pieces of the blueprint um, that um, have been introduced and that we're um, just getting more details on right now. Uh, as part of the, uh, the the governor's may revise. Yeah, I mean that that the additional surplus was pretty impressive in, in those numbers in the in the, in the new revise. Um, Senator, so there's a couple of people who have been putting questions into the the chat. Um, you know that uh, basically basically the questions what what they're they're opposite sides of the coin, but the questions are basically the interaction of state laws and local municipalities, you know, need to follow them or, you know, local municipalities, you know, attempt to circumvent them. And so I'm just kind of curious if at a high level, how do you view, what do you, how do you think about this interaction of the interaction of the state laws on housing and, um, you know, a municipality's responsibility or, or response to these, um, to these state rules. Yeah, well, it's important. I just actually just got up to town with the town of Woodside with three council members, and they they were very clear. They said we are going to meet our arena goals. Um, uh, but we're going to meet our housing element goal. I mean, I'll have to say how exactly he traced it, but he said we are going to meet our um, uh, goals. Maybe maybe meant specifically for the housing element, but it was it was quite interesting. Um, I had another call with another council, uh, another mayor. Uh, today asking them, they said, okay, well, they're going to send us some stuff around 
um, you know, how they're interpreting, how they're defining SB9 and all that. So, um, I mean, yeah, a lot of this stuff, the rubber hits the road at the local level. You can try to create laws for the state level. For example, as with SB9, there's certain things um, get interpreted at the local level and take a while to, to play out. So ultimately, we really need uh, municipalities to embrace this. And we want, um, we want residents and mayors and council members to embrace this and think, okay, how can they uh, make sure that uh, this gets built and hopefully gets built in the best way for uh, their, uh, their city. So, you know, you do see different approaches, but, you know, there's an article yesterday about Atherton saying, great, we're, we're going to build townhomes. And then there was an article, you know, again, my conversation today with Woodside. So it, it is interesting. A lot of cities are working in good faith to try to implement, um, uh, try to implement these, these laws. I did a, an hour also a town hall with uh, the mayor, Mayor Bernia, Mayor of San Mateo, which will be soon the largest city in my district once I lose Sunnyvale in 2022, uh, uh, um, and um, talked about the initiatives that, that, that uh, San Mateo is doing. So we do see a lot of people working actively at the local level in, a, in an actually productive manner. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? Like there certainly are, um, you know, like in any in any situation, right? There are better actors and somewhat, you know, worse right. actors. And so, you know, I um, and I do think that we are fortunate that, uh, well, it's kind of interesting, right? Throughout the Bay Area, I think we have, I think we experience both, right? And so, uh, yeah. so you know, uh, one person wanted to know, um, you know, how will the legislature hold PG&E accountable? And so, curious if you, uh, curious if you have some uh, any any opinions on uh, on PG and A. I do. That could be a whole other half hour. So, I'll sure. just to say, you know, my predecessor focused a lot on this. There is a procedure to take over PG and A if they trip hit certain trip wires. Um, but yeah, I mean, more broadly, it's. Um, you know, as we all know about sort of the the malfeasance and, and some other poor um, just poor decisions that were made by PG e over the years. Um, you know, we see some positive indications from them, but uh, by and large, up here, um, you know, it's a struggle every day on climate. And people think we're California, we're a progressive state, uh, we're doing great things, but and the utilities. Um, or sometimes on the on the right side of that PG and electric, um, but um, but 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 times are not. So um, I'll just leave it at that for now. Other than say that you know I have a very systematic uh, getting to twenty four seven clean energy, and um, look forward to that. Uh, like maybe you can react to the governor's, but I'm getting in a. Uh, Car, I have no car right now, so I'm about getting a ride. Um, so I'm getting into a car. Hold on. Uh, so I'll be back with you one minute. Okay, I'm back. Uh, all right. So, sounds good. So, I mean, you touched on that. You touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could speak to kind of like how do you feel like the housing element, the housing element conversations are going uh, in the municipalities throughout your district? Yeah, it's hard. You know, I have. Um, it's you know, it's Senator, right think, now it's you know, our busiest time for, uh, for Bill. Josh, Josh we're actually, you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. So it may be worth yeah. it. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll turn off, yeah, yeah I'll turn off yeah. video. Maybe that will yeah. be helpful. Um, yeah, I was just saying, you know, we're really trying to keep track and Alex Kobayashi from my team, who you know, uh, we try to keep track of what's happening uh, with the various um, plans. How can we make, how can we use technology? How can we make sure that um, these plans are more searchable, they're more transparent? Um, even whether folks are meeting the arena goals or not, it, it always takes me a tremendous amount of time to figure out and say, okay, where is the city on hitting this goal? Um, where are they in low and very low and moderate and market rate? Um, so I do think we need better transparency. I know there are various initiatives on this, um, but that's just one thing I will say. Uh, otherwise, I would just say for me at this point, it's still fairly anecdotal, but I do feel like a lot of our uh, cities are working in good faith. Okay. No, that's that that is that is great to hear. Um, and so, uh, 
I guess, you know, as a, uh, a, uh, a final question, what can we as advocates do to be helpful uh, for you and your, you know, pro-housing, pro-environment legislation? Um, good. I'm going to keep this on. Is, it, is the sound okay? Yes. So, yeah. Okay. I'll keep this on for now, and then you can let me know. First of all, I appreciate that uh, very much. And um, as you know well, even though a lot of we make a lot of important decisions at the state level, there, there aren't actually that many people who weigh in at the state level. And so um, the more that you can weigh on on specific bills, uh, especially uh, someone like Utah who knows the process well and um, you know knows how it works, um, the more that can be done, the, the better. Um, you know, I would say um, you know pushing this sort of push for transparency at the local level, I think would be really helpful. Um, whatever we can do to make sure these things are available, that um, they're searchable, that um, you know we have a good sense of whether people are on track or off track, uh, that itself will be very helpful. Uh, but otherwise, it's doing what you're doing and just being engaged in the process because, um, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, you get very specific interests that are involved in very specific things. But otherwise, we often don't hear from people. So, you know, another question popped up. And so I'm curious if you have, uh, have, an, have an opinion. So do you think the recent ruling on zoning by California courts will lead to good faith housing policy? Persons then says, seems many cities like LA have been acting in bad faith when it comes to realistic housing measures. I'm not sure that I would agree that the LA city has been acting in bad faith, but this is what the, this is what the, I think we can stick with the first half of the question. Do you think the recent Which, ruling on zoning by California courts will lead to good faith housing policies? Yeah, I'd, like, I'd be curious which, which because there have been a number of rulings. I'm curious which ruling specifically uh, the questioner is is writing about. I don't know if they're able to uh, provide um, additional yeah. clarification there. Um, but I think. Um, how about how about we know, change the, the question governor, a little? I, I say. Well, I'll just say this. You know, if you listen to the governor, he was very focused on housing accountability, and he talked about putting money towards accountability. Um, you know, he was he was very clear. He referenced Atherton and uh, the discussion. You know which was interesting. So um, I just say that, um, uh, you know, he was very focused on accountability and that was good to hear. And it's also, right, it's also interesting, certainly attorney, the attorney general, right, Rob Bonta is, you know, he is being very aggressive on, um, on enforcing housing laws. And I think that that is, um, I think that's. I think his predecessor was always very good on housing, but certainly did not have something like a housing strike force. So, what do you think? Like, what do you think is the change? Like, and maybe this is more of a political question than a policy question. But like, does it seem to you that the politics on housing are moving people in a direction of being like, hey, this is something that the the, the voters of California are really supportive of making sure that every municipality is doing its part. Yeah, I mean, as you know, it plays, it plays out differently in, sure. in different uh, cities, and, and including in my district. But what yeah. I will say is, yeah, I, I think in part the politics, but you do need the accountability. I mean, what was interesting on the call today um, with Woodside, they said very specifically, you know, we're going to meet um, our requirements and, and we're not willing to take the risk of not meeting them. Right, and so you know the real feeling that, um, um, you know that there's they, these cities could be sued for millions of dollars, you know, each year, um, is certainly uh, motivating. That helps people. Sometimes you need that to help people do the right thing. Okay. Well, you know what? I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna let you go a couple of minutes early. I was. Is there any any um, any last words you'd like to say to kind of the crew before? We kind of sign you off. No, thanks. I was sort of scrolling through a little bit, see some familiar names. And uh, uh, again, thank you for all for uh, what you do and staying involved and stay in touch. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we, we, we look forward to continuing to grow our relationship with you, Senator. And, you know, let, we're certainly going to find 
uh, some pieces of legislation to work with you on. So we look forward to those. Well, thank you. Thanks to you and Ali. Thanks for all for inviting me. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Um, Zoe, are you are you with us? I am with you. Hi, hey, Todd. Zoe. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. I am. Uh, I know it's a couple of minutes early, but if you are ready, I'm going to turn the program over to you now. Great. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, and thanks for, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Siegel, and I am the Director of Climate Resilience at Greenbelt Alliance. Um, it was really great to hear from Senator Becker about all of you know the housing updates to the budget. Um, and for those unfamiliar with Greenbelt, we are a nonprofit organization based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. Um, and we use our expertise in land use policy and advocacy and regional collaboration to really realize a housing secure, a housing secure climate resilient Bay Area. And we know that housing is a really important part of the climate agenda, which is why I'm so excited to be talking to everyone today. Um, and I spent a lot of time, you know, really thinking about how we can address the intertwined, you know, housing and climate crises. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to asking our panelists a few questions about this. Um, and as it has been mentioned already, uh, you know, the housing element process is happening all around California this year. And I've been saying that, you know, this is the most exciting housing element ever, as if, you know, as if the other housing elements weren't exciting, um, just because this is the first time that really we're seeing the impacts of our climate. We have to address the impacts of our climate crisis and our housing crisis together and the housing element really is the clear way to, to do that. Um, and you know, according to the California State Auditor, Elaine Powell, California will fall short of meeting our 2030 goals of a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels, unless emissions reductions occur at a much faster pace. And even in a scenario where you know, we have full vehicle electrification, we need to reduce our vehicles mile vehicle miles traveled by at least 15% in, or in order to meet this climate goal. And building more housing and more housing near transit in particular is a critical way that this will happen. I think you know this 40% below 1990 levels still is doable, but it's going to take major innovative changes across a wide variety of sectors, which is going to have to include an increase in housing, you know, parking reductions and open space protections. Anyways, um, so I'm going to you know do an introduction to each panelist ask them a little bit more about their role, and then we will all open it up to a, you know, a full panel conversation. And we'll hopefully have some time at the end for, for a Q&A. So those in the audience, please feel free to continue asking uh, questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to start with an introduction for Helen Chapman. Helen is the director of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, Area 3, and Helen's dedication to improving and serving community spans decades. She has served on the board for Green Foothills, the San Jose Parks Commission, and has co-founded the San Jose Parks Foundation. Currently, she's the vice chair for the Santa Clara Valley oh, <laughs> Open Space Authority for Area 3 and works as a policy and legislative aid advisor for council member Sergio Jimenez, District 2, specializing in housing and environmental policy. Welcome, Helen. Um, and I'd love to ask you, you know, what a little bit more about what your role in government is. And how does your work really address the climate and housing crises? Thank you, Zoe. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I, I love to showcase a, a photo of kind of, you know, the significant work we've been doing. That is Coyote Valley that's behind me in my screenshot. Um, I think, you know, my scope is, is community-wide. It's not really specific to one issue like housing or environment. So there, I'm in a unique position where I can connect the dots between both critical issues. Uh, and some of the work that we're doing right now is um, we are addressing the housing element and where it's appropriate to build housing and look at the fair housing initiative. And then we're also addressing uh, trying to, you know, reduce our carbon footprint at the same time. So it's important to have that connection between um, the appropriate place to build and then to have that connection to open space. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. All right, um, so our next panelist is Claudia Rossi, who is a 12 year educational leader who has served on the Santa Clara Board of Education for eight years, including two years as board president during the height of the COVID pandemic. She's a recipient of the NAACP Dorothy Height Award, California Assembly Peacemaker Award, and the CARUS Community Champion Award. Claudia is a chronic disease management nurse serving the county's most vulnerable communities. 
Claudia is also a candidate for Board of Supervisors District 1. Welcome, Claudia. Um, could you also tell us you know, a little bit more about your role in government and how your work really addresses the housing and, and climate crises? Thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted to be with all of you today. Um, I am um, speaking to you as a registered nurse who happens to hold public office. And I say that because uh, in my estimation, the climate and housing crisis is a public health crisis. And I'll share with you a little bit about my views. Um, after we had um, the, the, the fires that caused many of us to have to evacuate um, two summers ago, as a nurse, I saw an uptick in uh, asthmatic episodes of our children that lasted months after the fires were put out. And so as an RN, as a practicing nurse that works uh, in our most underfunded communities, I see the effect that uh, hazardous uh, air quality has on our communities. And as a registered nurse who is looking ahead to the fact that in 2040 or by 2040, over a million of our residents will be older adults, the housing crisis uh, that our caregivers face, many of whom make about $14 an hour to care for our older adults and, 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 and people with disabilities who uh, are in their homes. The fact that we haven't invested in affordable housing for that workforce is a public health crisis. Um, I am in my role as a trustee on the County Board of Education, I'm very proud um, to share that the county office has been at the forefront of educating our next generation of, of um, adults. Uh, we have made sure to embed in the science standards environmental literacy. And we follow that public health model that says that when you want to change the behavior of adults, you educate their children. And that is an approach that um, many utilize uh, in raising awareness about the harms of cigarette smoking. You educate the younger generations because they will be those advocates. So the county office um, funds the Walden West uh, programs that bring in a liter environmental literacy to educate our next generation of environmental advocates and champions. I'm happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Claudia. And I would love to learn more about that environmental literacy program. All right, next we have Alfred Tu, who is an architect, artist, and planning commissioner, and who has also done a lot of illustrations and advocacy work around housing, transportation, and planning. And I know Alfred has quite a bit of, uh, you know, experience and illustrations, um, but Alfred actually uh, illustrated a Greenbelt Alliance Resilience Playbook uh, resource for us a couple of months ago. And I'm going to drop it in the chat just as a, uh, an example of some of Alfred's amazing work while, while, we, while we chat. But first, Alfred, I would love to ask you a similar question. Um, you know, what is your role in government and how does your work address the housing and climate crises? Sure, thank you. So on the Berkeley Planning Commission right now, we are looking at the city's general plan housing element update, just like every other city in the Bay Area is right now. And we are looking at where our city will meet its goal providing housing. And also looking at how do we really make sure that all the different neighborhoods, both the rich neighborhoods especially, are doing their fair share in meeting our housing goals. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. So, you know, I think we, we've touched on, you know, the important role of, of the housing element, you know, in each of your respective cities a little bit. Um, but I would love to uh, ask you a little bit more about how, you know, the state and local housing policies have impacted um, the climate crisis. Um, and maybe, uh, Helen, I will direct this question to you first, if that's okay. Um, you can't address the elephant in the room SB9 without some controversy, right? And I think it's important 
to have that conversation because we need to look at all the tools in the toolbox, especially because we can't afford sprawl. I mean, I think I think we understand that, and because the cost of providing the infrastructure in the in the areas into our foothills into Coyote Valley will cost us more than it will developing good development within infill areas. Where I would like to see the conversation continue is that we don't have a conversation that pits housing against the environment. I would like to see it as an and. I think we need to talk about housing and the environment and bring in advocates from both sides because I think then we change the conversation to what surrounds good development and access, especially access to communities of color, access to disadvantaged communities that maybe are more impacted and don't have that access to a park or a trail or can get out to Coyote Valley to go take a hike. And so um, there are a lot of discussions now about where housing should be placed. And I think it's it's going back to, it's, it's the good policies that we go back to the general plan within the city of San Jose about densifying around urban corridors, around transportation corridors, and we should look at building up. But again, again, I, I wanna reemphasize it's, it's affordable housing and environment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know, as Green, Green Buff Alliance is an environmental organization that also really works with with housing organizations um, and you know oftentimes you know we really are are really trying to bring you know the housers and, and the and the environmental groups together around these shared uh, these shared issues and I think more and more people are really seeing that like holistic you know need to, to really come together and I think you know uh, Coyote Valley your background uh, image is a, is a great example of that in the South Bay um, but I think you know in order to you know meet our meet or exceed our arena goals, we really are going to need to have, you know, the environmental groups um, um, come together and really, you know, work with the, you know, housing advocates to make sure that we're protecting the areas that need to be protected and and building on, on, in the areas that really, you know, could use more development. And I think it it's a, you know, it's a two way street. And so I'm, you know, really looking forward to continuing kind of conversations with both, you know, environmental and housing partners about this. And so I. I just want to urge us to bring um, other communities that are interested in this discussion, and it's the firefighting communities. Uh, right now, our fire season is about three months longer than it used to be. And I have many friends who are firefighters who now say, you know, we used to think that at winter time, we as firefighters that our families could take a break uh, from the threat uh, to their lives, to their very lives caused by these very lengthy fire seasons. Now we have winter fires. And so whenever we uh, allow for um, irresponsible sprawl where these buildings are, or these housing uh, communities are put on hills that the firefighters can't access, surrounded by highly flammable uh, wildlife, um, our firefighting community is affected in a very real way. And so bringing into the discussion uh, those communities, those firefighting frontline worker communities, I think would serve us very well in these discussions. Yeah, absolutely. The firefighting communities, as well as you know the communities that live in the wildfire zones already to really make sure that we are you know, not putting uh, you know, communities at risk by, you know, building more in, in wildfire, high wildfire severity zones. But at the same time, you know, making sure that the housing that we are building does really have a lot of the wildfire protections. And um, at Greenbelt Alliance, we've also, you know, done a lot, a lot of research into the value of open space for wildfire protections and the use of green belts. And green belts can be, um, you know, like around, a, you know, a full open space around a city or smaller pieces, um, you know, like a, a bike lane or a park or something that can act as a fuel break. And so I think it's really important to bring in, you know, in, in, the, in the firefighting community and the, you know, the communities who are, you know, stakeholders in the, you know, the, the issue of wildfire, which is a quite a, quite a few people. Um, Alfred, how has, uh, how do you think the state and housing policy has impacted our region's climate crisis? Sure, as the others have mentioned earlier, there's the issue of development in wildfire zones, issues of development that's paving over farmland in the Central Valley. But then biggest of all is the commute times and the 
amount of driving that people have to do when auto jobs are over here and auto homes are over there. And I think the most important thing I can say for people to remember is this concept of jobs and housing balance, where if somebody works somewhere, there should be somewhere nearby for them to live. And we've seen this come up a lot in the Bay Area where cities will build a lot of office parks and office buildings. And they'll build some apartments, but not anywhere near enough to house everybody that's gonna be working there. A good ratio to remember is that for every one office building, you'll need about six apartment buildings of the same size to create that balance. So think about how big a desk is compared to how big an apartment is. And so a lot of the cities that have built a lot of offices, they have a lot of catching up to do to make sure there's enough places to live as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, with with that housing, we also need to add, you know, other amenities like parks and and you know, bike lanes and increased transportation to really, you know, create communities, you know, out where the office parks are, so that it, they're not just these like, you know, standalone, um, you know, pockets of of in industries, and we can kind of create create communities there. Uh, all right, I think that let's let's chat a little bit about you know what policy reforms each of you are working on. Um, either, you know, at the local level or things you're excited about at the state level um, and what, you know, what impact do you think they will have on the housing and climate crisis? So, Claudia, maybe, maybe I'll ask that question to you first. I really appreciate that because one of the things that um, as a registered nurse I see is that so many of us that are in the caregiver, caregiver industry, for lack of a better term, Many of my colleagues cannot live in the communities where they care for our elderly and for our most vulnerable. Um, I don't know how many people know that uh, a CNA or someone who works caring for our elderly uh, in their homes, they make uh, about $14 an hour, less than the salary of some people who work at In-N-Out Burger. And um, as we face an aging population, like I mentioned, over and by the year 2040, over a million residents will be older adults. We need as the county, and I'm, I'm running for, for, for County Board of Supervisors, I would like to see us invest in housing for caregivers um, near transit corridors, near other amenities, and to really take the opportunity to engage in dialogue with communities that are resistant to investing affordable housing so they can, we can have the discussion that when we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about housing for our teachers, for our caregivers, uh, for people who, um, who will make it possible for our aging population to remain in the homes and communities where they live. So I think putting a face to uh, the people that need these investments, I think will, um, we'll start a, a, a more profound discussion about our need to invest in, in housing. And um, on the Board of Supervisors, I know that they're looking at investing in uh, caregiver housing uh, near um, county facilities, near transportation corridors. So I think the discussion is moving in the right direction, um, but I would like to see us put a face to the people that need those investments. And a lot of them happen to be the people that I work with, the caregivers. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in order to, you know, really reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we need to really create, you know, diverse communities where people of all income levels are really able to, you know, live and work and, you know, get around without a car. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that is is underlooked right now, but the, the concept of, you know, you know, we have market rate housing, we have, and we have affordable housing, but there's plenty of people who, you know, wouldn't qualify for either of those. And so we really need to, you know, build out our, our workforce housing and our, you know, missing middle housing in order to really, you know, meet our, meet our climate goals. Um, Helen, I would love to ask you the same question. Uh, what are some, you know, policy reforms that you're either working on or are, or are excited about related to this subject? 
Oh my gosh. Um, there's a couple of things. One is in Coyote Valley, we're going to be kicking off the visioning, which is, you know, now that we've acquired about a thousand acres on the valley floor. Um, now the next in the next question is, what do we do with this? Right. Um, and we're looking at um, strategically um, incentivizing, you know, maybe small farmers for local food production. Um, education program to you know promote regenerative soils so that people get an idea of what the valley floor could do we lost a lot of acreage you know to the you know to to paving over and so i now i think it's time that we can we can restore some of that and then we've we've got some things in the, in the plans for that um and on the city level there's kind of an overlap between what the Obese Savoria City is looking for in terms of the tree canopy which is one really easy way we can start to reduce our, our greenhouse gases is just by you know, the natural uh, planting more trees and then we are, we're doing that in the city but we know that we've lost some tree canopy so we're going to look at some areas within the city of San Jose one area to the north one area to the south where we can add a numerous amount of trees and then look at the amount of carbon that the trees are actually reducing quantify it and show that then we're making a significant area and in, in, in terms of doing that um so those are two things right now kind of where my work intersects between the open space and the city which is it's kind of exciting yeah and i think increasing, increasing the tree canopy is so important you know to meet our our climate goals um especially you know as we you know as we build more housing we may need to you know cut down you know one or two hopefully not too many trees but really making sure that we're not only replacing those trees, but like really, really, you know, doubling or, or tripling the amount of trees that we have, you know, in, in the urban core and, you know, really increasing the tree canopy, um, you know, outside of the city as well for, uh, you know, to meet our uh, health, uh, our, you know, urban heat island as, you know, climate change increases and temperatures rise, making sure that our cities remain cool, as well as, you know, the carbon sequestration and, and natural biodiversity benefits of, of the tree canopy. Oh, uh, all right. I was absolutely because I mean, you know, if you for developing infill, we want good development, but again, and then you want those, you don't want to create those, those urban heat islands where then, you know, we're not getting, we're not helping the people that are living there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Alfred, what local or state policies are you excited about? Sure. So at the local level, one thing work we recently did that we're hoping to take to the state level is parking reform where in the past there were often the city zoning would require new buildings to have far more parking than was actually needed mm. and definitely far more than any, most of the existing buildings had and the parking is expensive to build it uses a lot of the concrete that the state senator mentioned earlier is a highly polluting material to produce and it also causes a lot of traffic. And what we've seen is that with the rules relaxed in Berkeley, it means that new buildings they don't necessarily have to build as much parking as they used to. And we recognize that some people are still going to be driving, but anything we can do to switch from two car households to one car households to having car sharing, that all makes a big difference. And then the other thing that we've been able to do as well is with narrowing some of the streets, there's opportunity to get more space for street trees, for planting strips, to bring some of that green space in. And thinking about having these streets more designed for the people that live there, as opposed to for people driving through at high speed. Yeah, absolutely. Parking policy is one of the things that, you know, one of the policies that I also hold near and dear these days. And I think it's really one of the critical ways that we can both, you know, address our housing and climate crises together. I've been working with the, the city of San Jose on their parking policy reform right now, which is tentatively planning on going to the San Jose Council on June 20th. So June 21st. So everyone who lives in San Jose or wants to get involved, uh, definitely reach out to me because I think the more support we have, uh, for parking policy reform, you know, at the local level, the better. It's also, you know, there is a state bill about it this year as well. But um, 
you know, one of the right now parking parking is, you know, 99% of parking is free. And it's really, you know, one of the only things in our, you know, in, in life that's free. I mean, we pay for water, we pay for our housing, we pay for pretty much everything, but have this assumption that parking is free. And really it's it's not free. We're paying the price in our affordable housing and in our, you know, and, and on our streets. And the people that, you know, can't afford a car are also paying those prices. And so it also becomes, you know, an equity issue. And so if we can work to not not to eliminate parking, obviously driving is important for many, many reasons, but if we can just separate parking requirements and make it more based on, you know, the economic need of, of that area, we can, you know, um, we can, you know, reduce our parking and make it only, you know, as needed. And then use, as Alfred was saying, you know, use the leftover space for parks or bike lanes and, you know, have, um, you know, transportation demand management strategies like giving everyone um, bike, you know, giving everyone transit passes or, you know, bike shares or, or you know, community amenities that can actually benefit people, you know, on, on the transportation side of things. And so, yes, very, I think, I think parking policy really is, you know, one of the most critical, you know, housing and climate strategies. And, you know, talking about, uh, you know, what Helen was saying in the beginning about kind of bringing the environmental and housing groups together. I think this is one of those key policies that everybody really can come to the table because, you know, parking policy uh, reduction can lead to more urban greening. It can lead to, you know, increased bicycle infrastructure. There's a lot of really shared, there's a lot of shared benefits uh, that we can all, all get behind through parking policy reform. Um, okay, so how do you think, you know, what's the best way that community members and advocates can really, you know, support um, environmentalism and the pro housing movement? Alfred, I know I just asked you a question, but I'm going to go in a reverse order and start with you this time. Sure. I would say the most important thing is to just let your elected officials know that you support these things because so often they only hear from a handful of voices. And don't assume that just because you believe something that they know that you need to let them know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Claudia, what about you? I really love that the sentiment that sometimes it's the tyranny of the small groups, the loud small groups uh, that, that usually uh, are at the forefront of, of, of a discussion. Um, I see as a healthcare provider, um, the message uh, around supporting um, bike routes, um, making our communities more pedestrian friendly. Uh, we, and I think maybe Helen could speak to this more than I can, but consider the pedestrian deaths the people that uh, live in communities where they, they literally take their lives into their hands if they want to go walk in their own community. And so I think that uh, when you consider that one, um, in, in Santa Clara County alone, um, we have a growing majority of people who are pre-diabetic and don't even know it. And a lot of that is connected to a sedentary lifestyle where we are, uh, we spend most of our day at work seated in front of our computers, our laptops. We get into our car, we go home and we really have a very sedentary lifestyle. So again, I think that investing in um, safe routes to school for our kids so they can walk to school, so they can bike to school is also something that'll benefit us, um, that'll benefit our health truly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've seen, you know, as a result of COVID, really the, you know, the, the health benefits of, of open space beyond, you know, the, the climate purposes as well. And I think we have even more reasons to, you know, to protect our, our open spaces and to create more, more open spaces and more, you know, ways that people can, can enjoy our open spaces, whether it's more, you know, more bike lanes or more parks or, or, or the like. Uh, Helen, uh, what about you? 
Yeah, just to, to, to add on to that, our, our preserve saw an over 300% increase in usage during COVID. So we know that people, when they were locked up inside, needed to get out. And what did they do? They chose to go on a hike and trail to go outside and, you know, just to get fresh air because um, it was safe to do so. So we know the, the critical health role that our open space provides. Um, to answer your question about how we can support environmentalists and pro housing movement, um, it's we got to separate, separate the politics from the problems and solutions. The issues have become very politically charged, and therefore we are tossing around labels and we're tuning out the conversations. And more often than not, the opposition to progress stems from fear of change, right? We need to have more honest conversations about what people are afraid of so we can correct the assumptions and demonstrate how the solutions will build a better community and a future for everyone. You know, we're, we're, too, we're too focused on what we're afraid of and not looking at listening to the person next to us and accepting the fact what where their fear is, where their fear is stemming from and, and trying to build some commonality around it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I have some more questions for you guys, but I'm also gonna mix in some questions um, in the, the Q&A as well from the audience. Um, so somebody asked, you know, wouldn't you agree that workable transit is really the key to parking reduction and VTA, you know, I guess this is more of a, an opinion, part, the, this part is less of a question, but, and that VTA isn't providing it, you know, in most places. And I think, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a chicken and the egg question, like, do we provide, should we provide the increased transportation options first, or do we, you know, create the, you know, the demand for the, the transportation first? Um, so maybe uh, I'll ask Helen, um, you know, wouldn't you agree that workable transit really is the first, uh, you know, the most, the thing that you need to do first for parking reduction? I think, you know, if you go to other great cities and I've been to, to London and Vancouver, you know, they have really good transportation systems. And I think we all acknowledge that San Jose is, is needs improvement in the transportation system. I mean, I, I think, you know, that there's nothing saying that, that we can't acknowledge that. Um, I also think it's important that if we're developing also our open spaces that we find transportation alternatives to get people out to those spaces. Because again, you don't want to be driving cars up and down Monterey Road and parking and huge parking lots to go access. So how do we get public transportation to some of our disadvantaged communities using pre-existing spurs like Monterey Road, um, you know, to do that? I think there, we have to be more creative. I think we, we have to look at other alternatives and things that are, you know, more user-friendly and, and encourage that first mile and last mile traveled. And I think sometimes we're, we're very focused on BART we're very focused on high-speed rail, but we're not focused on the short-term solutions. And people want public transportation that's quick, that's clean, and that's accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Claudia? Well, I think that given the price of gasoline, when it's, um, these are discussions that are happening. And, and I know I've heard from many of my constituents and patients that if there was a, a workable alternative um, to using uh, your own personal car, they would jump on the opportunity. Um, so I, um, I also want to, to share that I, I agree with the grand jury recommendation um, that calls for the VTA board uh, to be um, reorganized so that it's not a, a body that is uh, made up of elected officials who oftentimes lack expertise in transportation issues. Um, I, I believe wholeheartedly that that board should be made up of, of people who have real working knowledge of these transportation issues. I don't believe we'll see real reform unless we reform the makeup of the VTA board. Yeah, and Alfred, I know you are not uh, based in the South Bay, but do you have any, any thoughts on do we, you know, do we need to build the increase in transportation first or, you know, create the demand for it? I think you have to do both at the same time. And because of the way transit is funded, where most of the money comes from property and sales taxes, when you have more people living in areas, you'll have more money to fund better bus transit. And we're not that far from a level uh, population density that's really needed to support decent transit. 
once you go from one house on every lot to having duplexes or accessory dwelling units, that's really all it takes to get from a transit system that's infrequent to one that comes every 15 minutes or so. Yeah, absolutely. I think in many places we already have have the demand and you know, if we're going to remove parking minimums, it's going to be over a, you know, a long, a long time period for that to really be realized. And in that, in that time, we need to really do the work to increase our transportation so that when we are, when we do have fewer people, you know, driving, there is a, you know, they have a reliable transit system that they can really, uh, really use to get to jobs and, and, uh, you know, family events and things like that. Um, I would love to, I, you know, hear maybe a little bit more about um, your your work on if you've if you've engaged at all in your city's housing elements. And I think, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the housing element really is this like critical moment to really make sure that uh, environmental policies are are a part of the housing element and that we're, you know, protecting open spaces. And I would love to learn a little bit about, you know, if if you've gotten involved in your housing elements and if so, you know, what are some, you know, environmental pieces of the housing elements that you are excited about? Um, and if you haven't gotten involved in the housing element, uh, you know, maybe, you know, what are some of the environmental, you know, things happening um, in your city that you're, you know, really, really pushing for right now? And maybe we'll start with uh, Claudia. Well, you know, living in South County, I can tell you that we're surrounded by examples of how not to create these spaces. I am concerned about the segregative effect of, of some of these um, housing initiatives. I don't know how many of you have been to, to Gilroy, but we have a number of developments where people have, don't have any, they're not near any open spaces. There are these massive, massive buildings that, um, that segregate um, our, our more underserved communities. So, uh, to the extent that we could um, have housing that does not segregate, but that creates. Oops. Oh, we may have grown, but yes, I definitely agree. Um, maybe while well, Claudia, Claudia, can you can you hear us? All right, maybe we'll, we'll move on to, to Alfred and maybe Claudia can jump in. But Alfred, um, what are some exciting, you know, environmental pieces in the housing element, perhaps beyond the parking policy? Because this, you know, I could talk about parking policy all day long, but, uh, you know, beyond the parking policy, what other kind of environmental pieces are happening in the Berkeley housing element? Sure. At first, it looks like we've got Claudia back. If Claudia, oh, yeah. if you want to finish. Sorry. Oh, Claudia, would you? I, my apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Um, I was I was sharing that here in South County, um, I've seen enough of what I don't want to see uh, going forward, which is the segregation of of, of our you know our poorest community members. Um, that is felt acutely when you have um, housing developments that are not close to open spaces that um, that are that stack one family practically on top of each other. Um, when that happens in the community, it sends a very, very, um, I think, negative message about how who we are as a whole. And so any, any housing discussions, I think, need to support the ability of people to live in communities where there are dif uh, different options, but don't divide communities um, from each other. Yeah, absolutely. Alfred? Yes, and I think as we look at the general plan housing element updates on where housing will go in the future, in previous times, often it's been concentrated upon the busiest streets. And sometimes these apartments are used as a buffer between the loud, noisy street and the low density housing elsewhere in the neighborhood, which isn't so great for the people who live in these new buildings. And I think as we continue with housing, we need to look beyond just the 
commercial street itself, but also at the next block or two on either side of it, because those are residential areas and those are great places for more people to live, especially with some of these smaller scale buildings, whether it be the duplexes or the backyard cottages. Yeah, I think that's you know definitely a, a really great um, you know policy solution. Helen, right. have you been engaged in? Oh, sorry. Yeah, because when you live in a building that's a couple of blocks off the main street, you're still close enough to walk to everything, but it's much quieter. Exactly. Um, Helen, have you been involved in, in your housing element, and, and what are some of the pieces that you're excited about? Not, not to a large extent, um, but we've had some initial conversation around fair housing. And um, I mean, it's no secret the city of San Jose is behind in its affordable housing goals. So I think it's looking at the strategy of placement affordable housing. And I, and I feel strongly that affordable housing shouldn't be just congregated in certain areas in, you know, near downtown or like you said, off of, off of major roads, but they should have, you know, access to, to good schools, access to parks, access to trails, so that you are giving opportunities for people living in affordable housing to have the same quality of life choices that single family homeowners have. So I think it's, you know, it's looking at um, a policy that spreads affordable housing options. Oh, sorry, my dog. Uh, affordable housing okay. options around the entire city. Yeah, definitely. I think we, you know, in the housing element, we really want to make sure that, you know, we're building all types of housing and that that housing really is, you know, spread ac across the park, you know, spread across the city um, in, in equal ways. I think as, you know, climate impacts increase, you know, we don't want to have all of our, you know, our most vulnerable communities, you know, along the shoreline, you know, in a flood zone. And we really want to make sure that we have, you know, like balanced, you know, healthy, diverse communities uh, for so, so many reasons. Well all said. Right. I, well said. Thank you. Okay, I have one last question for each of you, and I like to end panels on, you know, a more inspiring note. I know, you know, we're talking about these like big, you know, tackling these big, heavy, you know, dual crises um, together. And I'm wondering, you know, what's something that really, you know, excites you about the, uh, you know, the, the environmental or, or housing work that you're doing? Like, what are you looking forward to? And let's go with Claudia. Looking forward to partnering so that so many of our children who live in South County, who are the, the children of migrant families, you know, I find it ironic that the very people that, that work um, cultivating the fields that feed us all, that they have children who have never enjoyed the bounty of our open spaces. And one of the things that I would love to see in the very near future are partnerships with our local school districts so that on the weekends, these children who oftentimes live in dwellings where three families are living in one tiny, tiny little space, I'd love to see a partnership where we um, transport our children from South County to these beautiful open spaces. Um, I, I dream about those moments because some of them and many of them have not been uh, to these beautiful spaces. So that fills me with hope um, so that these investments that we're making in an open space can also be enjoyed by our community's poorest and most underserved children. Yeah, absolutely. Helen, what, what excites you? I'm looking to a really robust community process when the Coyote Visioning Plan kicks off and, and engaging with communities. Claudia, just like you mentioned, is bringing the children out, bringing the families out, having conversations as a, you know, as a director, opening up the conversation, giving an, an opportunity to maybe to meet a park ranger, to look at a model of, of you know, how we grow our food, to get their hands dirty. So they have an idea of, of where their food is coming from you know, and what, what the possibilities are. I, I absolutely love when I, I see my grandson who's 19 months old, get, take his hands in my garden and just run his fingers <laughs> through the dirt and watch him experience that. It, is, it brings a joy to me that I, you know, I, I can't recall with my own kids, but I'm just saying, I think there's an opportunity there and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that community engagement process. Yeah, 
I am also looking forward to that community engagement process and, you know, look forward to uh, seeing you at some of those Coyote Valley visioning sessions. Absolutely. Alfred, what, what excites you? I would say on a similar note, seeing how kids, teenagers, people in their 20s are all really getting excited about city planning and thinking about what their community will look like when they grow older, because it's going to be their future that they're living in. And a lot of them have really started to take the lead on starting organizations and mm -hmm. talking to the rest of their community on how we can have a more environmentally friendly future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know I asked the question, but I'm also going to, to answer it. And I think, you know, definitely Gen Z is in inspiring to me as well. And I think, you know, having more of these conversations to really bring the environmental and, you know, housing people together and to create these shared, you know, these shared goals. I think, you know, this was, an, you know, an environmental housing conversation and we talked a lot about housing, but housing, you know, really is a key, a key climate solution. And I think the more we can get environment, you know, more environmentalists to really be also, also be pro-housing, the closer we can get to really meeting our, our climate goals and you know creating a, a healthier a healthier community for everyone and at the same time the more we can get the environmental the, the the housing advocates to really support stronger open space protections the stronger our you know relationships can be and the more we can kind of work work towards all of these shared goals and i think in the south bay in particular you know this is really starting to happen and it's it's very exciting um yeah, so on that note, you know, thank you so much, Helen, Claudia, and Alfred for, for joining us today. And thank you to uh, Todd and, and Allie from Hack for, for putting this on. I think it's been, you know, really great and inspiring to, to chat with all of you. And uh, yeah, look, and no, and Greenbelt Alliance and Hack and HLC, um, you know, and and e are all, you know, nonprofit organizations. And if you, you know, want to, um, you know, look us up and just sign up for our, our mailing lists, please, please feel free. And if anybody, this is a, you know, more of a personal professional plug. If anybody lives in San Jose and wants to get engaged in the parking policy work, definitely reach out to me. Um, otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for, you know, sticking around till the end. And we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, webinar. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.